Well, there's a famous line from The Godfather, and it says, Oh, just when I thought I was out, they draw me back in. And that's exactly what good friend Mark Morgan did here. Let me explain. We had painted this tank, and Mark went to assemble a bike. For some reason, was having trouble with putting the pet. I, I think if I got his story right, his <clears throat> story, he was having trouble underneath the tank, at the tank anyway, and, and decided to lay it upside down on a bucket. And you can see what happened. He's put a gouge, and it's a pretty deep gouge in there. I'm not sure we're going to be able to get that out within uh, a day or two. Kind of a deep gouge. But what we'll always do, and what we always try to do in the shop here, is if we do learn something, we try to share it. And if we know something, we try to share it. And maybe, maybe the lesson here is, uh, Mark would be willing to share it, is this paint is soft when it's new. Don't, don't abuse it, put your fingernail in it, or whatever. I don't know. I don't even remember how long ago we painted that, but, but anyway, it's all beside the point now. Now, what I'm going to try to do is go through the procedure I would use to repair this tank on this video. Now, as I've said a million times, before you do anything on a repair, first thing is to clean it. Now, I know no matter what, this, this has probably never been waxed. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But because I don't really know, but I know people have touched it with fingerprints and including myself. So anything we do, I want some, and this is, by the way, simple green. And by the way, I did find something I'm willing, I'm going to be trying as soon as this runs out. I bought a product in Harbor Freight that's a degreasing agent that worked great on degreasing motorcycle parts. I don't know if it's going to be appropriate for painting. We'll find out. Now, the other thing... We don't know if this is oil on it, grease on it. I may have to take that gas cap off eventually, but step one would always be try to get any of the uh, contamination off, fingerprints, whatever. And I don't know exactly. See, each one of these repairs is kind of an adventure. There's no two alike. It's, it's not like baking donuts where everyone's the same and you just put them in the oven. This, this is kind of like, uh, kind of like having kids. No two ever come out alike. So anyway, I guess I'll start with the smaller of the two. I want to go get some thousand grit sandpaper and a sanding block and just see how much of that material, see I, I'm sure there's enough clear on here, but if I go through into the blue, then I'm going to have to repaint the blue. That's the problem. So the first test will be some thousand grit. The reason the thousand grit and a hardwood block Nothing here fancy. What we want to do, I want with a hard block to just take off all the mountaintops if I possibly can. Soapy water. Now the reason for using thousand grit is I want to get a bond because I may have to re-clear the whole tank, may have to repaint the blue. I don't know yet until I grind down into this and see how bad it is. And this this is just a just a time consuming job here. I'm not going to let the camera run because what's going to happen in in five minutes you'll be putting on uh, something else. I don't. Maybe you put it on anyway. Who knows? Doesn't really matter. Now you never know if this is on a curved surface. You really have to be ultra ultra delicate. In the case of this, it's on a flat. I don't know. I'll just keep track of the time here. Give Mark some idea how much since we charge them by the hour, by the bagel or whatever. I, boy, I really hope he didn't go down into the blue here, but, but you never know. Thousand grit is gonna take a little time if you use 600 or rougher grit. What'll happen, it'll go quicker, but then you leave these, like I call them sanding scratches that hopefully we're not gonna have in a final part, even if we re-clear it. So, so what I'll do here is just basically just keep at this for the next 10 minutes here or so. Let me show this up close and see on a progress, a little progress basis. Yeah, now you can see there's what I call a ditch, a valley. We have to take enough of the material off that there's no valley, that it all looks like this. So again, because this is gonna take, I'm gonna just take a guess, 20 minutes, a half an hour of sanding, very carefully wiping it between, and hopefully not go through, but 
but the odds are pretty good that we're going to go through and have to repaint the blue. And the whole trick here is just patience. It's very tempting to want to pick up some rougher grit paper and just grind away. And, and I, didn't, I didn't want to leave this out. I want to go in every possible direction because in the end, I'd like that to be a flat area. Whether we have to do the blue or not, it's, it's besides the point. But it looks like we may have to do the blue, and I can see the reason for that is going to be is where this went down, it's already changed the color there. There's a color change from the, the paint being squashed down. So once I know I'm going to have to do that, well, there's no point trying to save it anymore. Yeah, we're coming through. See, what's happened, the paint is actually down into the, it's, it's down past the blue, and it's, it's gouged into the white already. So this changes it a little bit. Now I know I definitely have to sand all the blue. So I'm going to have to basically block sand all the blue here. See, I'm already coming through. So I wanted to show this because this is, even though I've got it flat, the blue is, is, is you're going right through into the white here. Where, where the paint made a mountaintop, the mountaintop is white. I don't know if that makes sense to somebody that's not a painter, but this this is pretty atypical of how you do these repairs. Then we also, because we're down so far, we also now have the additional risk factor of that the blue on top of this is going to melt this. And that's then it's catastrophic and it's it's time to sandblast the tank. So you can picture what happens. We're right here, there's a wrinkle in the blue paint. And because we've made this flat again, now we have this additional problem that right there, right, right there, that paint is, has become like a little mountaintop. It's, it's like you've squished it up and it's become a little mountain. And that paint, we're through now. We basically, uh, from this point on, there's not much we can do. This is gonna have to be resand. The whole blue has to be resanded. So I guess there's no point even trying here. We're not, we're not going to make any big deal. I'm going to have to sand that down. I'm going to have to, in sequence, no, no particular sequence, take the gas cap off, um, sand all the blue, reprime this. The primer is to try to seal the part underneath it so that the blue doesn't go down in and eat this up. The, the primer is not there for any other reason than just to seal it. So... The next step on this is going to be a very time-consuming thing, probably more than an hour or so. I've got to sand all the, all the blue till it looks like that. Now the problem with all of these things, the problem with all paint issues like this is sometimes you think, and this is, this is always what customers think, oh, there's a little scratch on a tank. Oh, just take care of the scratch. And in reality... This may very easily turn into that we got to resand blast the tank. So what I'm trying to do to the theory is I don't want to have to resand blast this tank. I want to try to save the decals, save the white, the amount of paint we put on here. Right? We probably already put on uh, $50, $100 worth of paint. I don't know, sandpaper. So we're trying to salvage what we already have into it. But on the other hand, I don't want to compromise the job and make it anything but, uh, you know, nicest we can possibly make it so we got the gas cap off now the next step I just put an edge on everything we're gonna to have to get out the sandpaper and this is really gonna be time-consuming it's a pain in the neck to do this but this is the only way I know to do this now since we know we're gonna to have to now repaint the blue I can transition now into let me try to show it always 600 sandpaper a little one one grade uh, rougher here anyway because a lot of this, this part here is going to be on just another part that's, the, the, the gouge doesn't look that deep, but it's down. That, that garbage can worked its way right down into the white. That's, well, hey. So my suggestion to Mark was, and I guess I could share this, that what I learned years ago and from modeling, yeah, on garbage day when people are throwing out a couch, Go take one of the cushions, take a razor, cut the cover off, and that big piece of soft foam that's under there is good for a lot of jobs where 
this would have been one of them, of course. So, of course, after the horse is out of the barn, you go by a fence. Uh, we all do that. But, but the idea is whenever I make a mistake, I like to share as much of it as possible so that hopefully, uh, hopefully I don't have to do these repairs that often. But anyway, I would say the equivalent of doing this is the equivalent of crashing a bike. That's about how much work is going to be involved in the overall repaint of this this tank now it'll it'll still remain to be seen whether we're going to have to do i don't want to do the white i don't want to do the decals oh my god it just it scares me to think that that's i try not to do this work in the summer with a few exceptions because first off we have the baby here and i can't really paint realistically i got to do everything outside but Anyway, we're coming up on, I guess you can see it here. Oh, that's deep. Wow. That's, there's no point even letting a camera run. This, this is going to be maybe an hour, hour and a half of work. Now, what happened is this turned out to be a lot more labor intensive than I thought it would be. As I'm trying to be careful when I go right up along the edge here, I don't want to I've got it, a piece of masking tape there before I back mask it, but it's just, it's just labor and I want to do as much of it as I can with a block, trying, trying not to go through any more than I have to. Again, because here's the real problem with this job from day one. What Mark did is he bought Sherwin-Williams paint with some kind of fancy hardener or fancy whatever it was that and I wound up eventually not even using the, the thinner that they gave me, that he gave me. It, it was just not working the way we wanted it to. And then the blue is not Sherwin-Williams. So the blue is the one that always is the problem. The blue is the one that is really unhappy. So what I'm going to do is put that Duplicolor sealer in between. Hopefully. Now, it's funny. The women across the street are having a garage sale. They took my table. So I'm going to have to improvise here for, for this project. But anyway, you can see there's just, there's no end. And every time you dry it off, I find another little spot that just, I like to get this as nice as possible, of course. I'm sure when Mark gets this bike done, I'm sure it's going to be worth all the effort we've put into it. Now next step, I want to take some Gorilla Tape and I don't want to get paint inside the tank, but I want this to stick. I want the Gorilla Tape to have a nice smooth surface here, so I can clean that out. Again, I like to use Gorilla Tape instead of masking tape, because what happens with masking tape, as you build up the clear, pieces of it start to come off. And it's, it's always to your benefit not to have that happen. Now the real test here is to make sure we don't have any disruption of that line. So I'm just going to retape that line at the very end. Hopefully that will work out just fine. And I always credit, always credit, unless I forget, which, and I forget a lot. The late Walt Prey shared a lot of technology with us. He was a custom, was a custom car painter in California and had some beautiful models over the years and this this thing of back masking with tin foil was one of the ones he shared with us i know other people that watch our videos have gone on to use it with modeling and with motorcycling both well it was several hours of work a lot of labor to get it to this point and again i always emphasize just having that little scratch a little dent a little something it can really escalate into a monumental job. Now, here's the problem right now. I'm going to seal this with the Duplicolor sealer. I'm going to let it dry for a couple hours outside in the sun, and then I'm going to put on a coat of blue and see. And if it starts to alligator skin in any of these spots, especially where we've gone through, then the only choice we're really going to have is to strip the tank, sandblast it. So, we, as I always say, we're going to find out if it's our lucky day. It really is never a lucky day. Now the reason for using this instead of some of the other primers that are available, the this is a sealer. Notice it says sealer. 
what I hope it's going to do is seal the thinner from the blue from going down into the white and the clear and all the paint that's already on there. The other kind, the other, the self etching primer, I, I've never had it really be a good sealer. This is a much better sealer when you're doing this. This is better if you're just going over raw metal. This seems to be better if you're going over a, a re-sanded finish that's going to be repainted. Hey, I need my paint table back. Where's my paint table? We making any money today? Maybe we could sell that red car. Oh, that's their car. <laughs> I got a paint without a paint table. Maybe that chair would be a good paint table. I don't know. Seems like we always have to work around several things. The weather, number one today, it looks like it's going to rain any minute. So we're kind of doing a mock schnell trying to get this going. But it would be in the best of all worlds if it just wouldn't rain for about another couple hours. I can get this into the garage. Okay, now the trick as always, going over these kind of spots, and it, it definitely, it doesn't work every time, but it works a lot of the time. You want to put on a lot of thin coats. I don't want to get a big, a big giant coat. Look at that, the sun's coming out. Oh my God. If I hurry up, I can get a ride on a two-stroke. There we go. Okay, now I want, actually I should put this out in the sun. I will move it out in the sun. I want to get on at least three coats and let the sun bake that. The more the sun bakes it, the better. Now that's the first coat, it's light, that's for sure. Now, as soon as I moved this to where the sun was shining, the sun went away. So, second coat, nice thin coats. Try not to build up a lot along the tape edge if possible. Hopefully this will seal if it's a thing. I don't know, is it Mark Morgan's lucky day here or something? I don't know. Let's be honest, it's all our lucky day. We live in a wonderful time. We get to play with our toys. Those of us who have made it to 72 still have a relatively good life. Even though I get abused by my children once in a while. Get beat up by a six year old. Okay, that's two coats, I'm gonna let that dry, even though the sun has gone away. And I will put a third coat on. About 10, 15 minutes between coats, and I'll be ready to, in fact, while it's dry, and I'll go mix up the blue. Now, I learned a valuable lesson years ago. Well, I learned it over and over again, because I'm not that bright. But when there's a third coat of primer drying, it, what happens, it gets dull, and you think it's dry. But it's not really dry. So what I have is I have another part that I'm working on. I'm going to give this an extra hour or so to dry while I prep and prime the other part. I have a, sped, a set of spare handlebars that I want to ultimately put on the R1. They're, they're an inch higher than the ones I have on there. And I want to have choices, of course. And I need to paint them. So I can do that. I can I actually I can prep them up and prime them while this is drying. I'll kill two birds with one stone. And hopefully the weather will hold out, but boy, never hold your breath on a day like today. You never know where this could go. But if we can get some blue on there before it starts raining, boy, that will, not only will I be happy, I'm sure Mark will be happy. Because to sandblast this tank is a major, major setback to the job. So I'm really struggling to try to keep this... Uh, this repair and of course the share if it works great and if it doesn't work we share it too It's the whole idea of sharing while that's drying. I wanted to share another little a bit of information what's happened in the past I don't even know how many years maybe five years or whatever I've I've really come to appreciate making the bike as comfortable as possible for you now But here's what happens and this is absolutely true doesn't seem like it's true, but it is true as you get older and older, and in my case, 72, what, what was comfortable at 62, and five years later, in fact, you, you want to be in a more relaxed position. Well, these handlebars are about, and I'm not sure, it's, it's about three quarters of an inch higher, and they sweep back about an inch. So having this will, will allow me to 
on the R1 to sit up just a little bit straighter. Now, the problem is a sport bike, if you were track biking all day long, well, I'm not sure that's what you'd want to do. But I have heard from Glenn that many people at the track have done just what I did seven, eight years ago, and they're happy with it. Well, I'm happy with it, so I don't care if they're happy with it. But here, anyway, the old set of rusty handlebars. No matter what you do, if you paint these, it's not going to be real good. Paint's going to peel off. I've got to roughen this all up. So I usually do that with a combination of first get the grid off. Always, no matter what you do, get the grid off. It's got to be rough. We got to prime it. Now in this case, where the handlebars go, I'll, I'll back mask that. Where the grips go, because I don't need to worry about that. I can leave that chrome, but the rest of it, I'm going to have to. And these bars are very nice. They have that knurled. I'm not sure that's going to line up with the R1, but now there's two bikes I want to do this to. Eventually I want to do the RD. And so what I may do is take the handlebars that are on the R1 off, put them on the RD, and I like to be able to switch. Now, a lot of times when you do this switch, you have to either make a longer brake line, a longer something, or the clutch cable needs to be rerouted or something. But each bike's individual. But I have never, I've retrofit a lot of bikes, even not my own. And I, it's, it's never a problem you can't work around. And what happens is you think, oh, I don't know, that's a lot of work. And you go ride the bike and, you, and Vince is the next one. Vince, when he does his Aprilla, you sit up. And you're enjoying riding a bike and you still got 150 horsepower and it's always more fun that way so next thing is get this over to the back master grips and get to the wire wheel going to do is scratch the chrome so it's got a scratch surface not a polished surface because the, the paint almost guaranteed not going to stick to that real well i gotta roughen that up and then i'll go over this by hand with a little wet and dry sandpaper some 600 sandpaper now i found a polywog in my set of polywogs that's exactly the shape of the bar and this is going to help me just make it easier some wet and dry sandpaper this is 600 but it's not critical to just go over this and and scuff it even more. And anybody that's ever tried to paint something that's chrome plated without scuffing it knows high risk that that paint is going to come off. And then all that work you've put in, it's like when you don't put a good foundation on a house and you build a beautiful house and you've got all that will work into it and, <laughs> and it just Anyway, I'll just show this real quick. That, that tool, that little polywog is good. Now see, this is what you have to strive for. This, let's get it. This has been wire brushed. This has not. And this has been sanded. So you can see, I don't, I don't know if you can see it. One side, but the duller and flatter you can make it, the better it is. I back masked off exactly where the R1 um, the risers are. And they're not an exact match to this set of bars because, the, let's face it, none of these bikes, this is, this is not made for this application. But this is a real nice set of bars and I'm glad I, uh, I'm glad I have choices because the Renthals are really nice, but they all seem like they have too much of a forward sweep. I like, even if everything else is the same, this sweep back makes it much more comfortable so and i i just hope that uh you know that i'm not wrong but the nice thing about doing this you can always put you can swap once you do the swap of the cables and the wires and everything and it, and your hydraulics are long enough once you do that the rest of it is you could swap it back to the old way or to the new way you could do that in, in an hour now another little tip whenever you a part like this you have to have some way of holding it I wouldn't want to put the vice grips on the side where the throttle is going to be. It may booger up the bar a little bit, but out here it's okay. But this is, this is the tip. A little safety thing. Put a rubber band, tape, something. Because what happens with vice grips, I'm going to hang this overnight in the garage at some point in time. This is how I'm going to hang it. And if the, if the vice grips happen to pop open, the part falls on the floor, and it could scar it. 
Now the next step here is let's get a coat of primer on this. Okay, so that primer is drying. Hasn't started raining yet, so I guess it is our lucky day. Now, if every, if every one of us was 18 years old and in perfect physical shape, those clip-ons would be great. And all you ever did was track days, but the reality is every one of these bikes, I have changed your handlebars on every one of these bikes. And on this one, I've just made risers. But the point I wanted to make was, at some point in time, reality sets in. You go for a 200-mile ride, and that last 50 miles, you want to die. You wish you just had handlebars. But when you have handlebars, these I painted a while back. These worked out pretty good. No modification that I've made to any of the motorcycles has been as significant of an upgrade as putting handlebars on. I just, and I, you know, I'm, and basically, of course, I'm old and feeble. If I if I had the uh, the body of a bodybuilder and uh, the mind of Einstein or whatever, but and to me, I actually think there are places and when you're in the twisties and stuff where the bars might be an advantage. Whereas sitting upright and Jose seems to agree with that, that that there might even be an advantage, say under a hundred miles an hour. And let's face it, we never go over a hundred miles an hour, never. So back to our primary project. This has been drying about two hours. So I feel safe and uh, I'm going to get the blue out. Again, we had a real issue with this the first time, so I'm, I'm really holding my breath here. But if I can get the blue on there, boy, I'll just, boy, I'll sleep like a baby tonight. All right, it's time to see if it's a lucky day. The world's loudest compressor. The, the trick here, and, and just to see, what I want to do, that's a very light coat. It's going to need three coats. Give it plenty of time to dry. While it's drying, I'll put the black on those handlebars, the gloss black. But Because it's the thinner that goes down and attacks everything. And the thinner, the thinner you make the paint, the colder the temperature, the more penetration it gets and the more problems you penetratively can have. So far, it looks like maybe we've lucked out. Now we got the bars painted black. They're pretty much ready for a coat of clear, but the idea is when I put the clear on that, I could put the clear on this, mix up one batch of clear. Use the same clear on both. And so far, the weather's holding out. Amazing. One more to go. Now luckily in the course of the day the sun has come out just enough. I baked that in. 
The sun's been in and out. It looks like it's going to rain. You never know what the hell's going on. But the, the sun is definitely our friend here in helping that bake up. So after an hour of drying, what I suspected might happen, happened. The blue paint does not like what's underneath it. And it's crazing and doing some crazy stuff up here. This one, I guess, looks okay. Now, because, well, there's not much I can do here, uh, I'm going to kind of just let this dry overnight, see what I can do about maybe patching that over with more primer because I've got it back masked. And we're down at, well, that one looks like it might be. And But this is what, this is always the problem when you mix and match paint. So what we're going to do here is we're going to live to fight another day. I'm going to see if I can patch that up. But the best thing is to let it dry for 24 hours and maybe hopefully sand that. But I don't know how I'm going to be able to seal that up. Again, that's, that's the problem with mix and match paint. Anyway, we're going to come back to this and we'll give it our best shot tomorrow.